Hey, what's up guys? It's Apollo Chia here back with a new part of What If Naruto Had Astro's Memories and before continuing this, if you haven't, please leave a like and subscribe to my channel and without further ado, let's continue our story previously. And your future is that, Kakashi said to Zabuza. Suddenly, two sand bones flew from the tree and pierced Zabuza's neck, killing him. Akiri Onin, Hunter Nin, dropped in and went to Zabuza's body. Kakashi checked his pulse and sighed in relief. The new clean was dead. The Oinin spoke. Thank you, Konhanin. I have been tracking him for a long time. You have allowed me to kill him. The Jonin stepped back, allowing the Kirinin to grab Zabuza's corpse in the sunshine. He disappeared with his body. Well, now that's that dealt with. Kakashi started before walking a few steps and collapsing on the floor. Kakashi sensei! Sakura cried and walked towards her unconscious teacher. He had overused his sharing gun, Sayuri stated, as she deactivated her own. Naruto picked him up in a fireman's carry and allowed Z Tazuna to show them the way to his house. The five arrived at Tazuna's house. Knocking on the door, a young lady dressed in a short sleeve pink shirt with long, dark blue hair opened it. Konichiwa, were Tazuna-san's security detail. Konoha no... Dinan, dainanaha. Naruto introduced, this is Uchiha Sayuri and this is Haruno Sakura. The person who I am carrying is my sensei Hatake Kagashi, a Muzumaki Naruto. Konnichiwa, I am Tazunami, the daughter of your client, she greeted. Tazuna commented, I wouldn't have made it without them. We were ambushed by three ninjas. Thank you, please make yourself at home. Tazunami said as she unsheared the team into the house. There was a kid wearing a yellow shirt, green overall and a white hat with blue stripes in the house. That is Inari, my son. Tazunami introduced. Then she led the team to the two bedrooms. These are the guest rooms. They are two futons per room. Anosa Sayuri Sakura. Who would you like to bunk with? Asked Naruto. Sakura cried immediately. Sayuri chan. Sayuri gave a defeated sigh and agreed. Besides, it was in her agenda to get further away from Naruto, not closer. Bunking with Naruto would be a mistake. Alright then. Let's split up and meet in two hours, Naruto suggested before entering one of the rooms. He set Kakashi down on the futon and tried to activate his Sage of the Six Pass mode to re revitalize Kakashi. However, he felt extremely fatigued and was unable to do so. Asura explained, Naruto-kun, you can only use it 30 minutes in a day at your current level as your body is unable to handle any more than that. This is limit. And, but for now, just rest. When you wake, train your Taijutsu. Your overcompensation almost ended your life in, if not for Sayuri. Now rest. Naruto felt drowsy and collapsed onto the waiting futon. Two hours later, the blonde ground and blinked as he sat up. His eyes adjusted to the brightening light room. It was four in the afternoon and Naruto felt like training. When he got downstairs, Sayuri and Sakura were already seated at the table, having high tea. He sat down and picked up a biscuit from a plate. After chewing, he asked, Shall we have some training done? Sakura nodded, excited to improve her taijutsu. Sayuri suddenly channeled chakra to her eyes, which turned from onyx to a beautiful vermilion hue. Two tomos lined a ring surrounding each of her black pupils. I've awakened my sharing gun. When Kakashi awakes, I'll have him train me in, it, in its usage. Sayuri spoke, not replied, all right then. From now, I'll be working on mostly taijutsu. Do you wish to join me and Sakura? The pink-haired girl nodded eagerly. Sayuri, can you teach me ninjutsu? Naruto asked sheepishly after humbling himself down. <laughs> Sayuri snorted. All right then. If you're gonna be of any use, you might as well learn something. Just find me once you're done with your taijutsu. With that, the Uchiha walked out of the door. Naruto raised an eyebrow but was delighted. Come on, Sakura. Let's go practice our taijutsu then. While the Haruno practiced her sand dances, Naruto went through Taijutsu Katas, placing emphasis on perfecting the form and fluidity of the transitions between each one. All the way Asura gave him pointers such as to vary the strength of his blows and the speed of his transitions to confuse the enemy. After all, unpredictability was his fort. Many points were incorporated into these sequences and other ne unnecessary maneuvers were scrapped completely from the kata. Within three hours, his Taijutsu standard was improved to roughly that of a tuning. It would take much more to catch a Jonin like Akashi of Kartho. In such cases, his rank served to deceive the enemy into believing that he was such a standard expected of those with the rank Ganin. At 7, he approached Sayuri for a ninjutsu crash course. Dope. Were you going to make me wait forever? spoke Sayuri as she stopped in the middle of her training. 
Sorry about that. Can we begin now? Not apologize. Alright, basically ninjutsu manipulates chakra to do things that you normally wouldn't be able to do. Like breathe fire or level the ground. To do an elemental jutsu, there are mainly two parts. Nature transformation and shape transformation. After you should hold chakra, nature transformation is applied first. The characteristic the jutsu element next you apply shape transformation which modifies the chakra for the purpose of the jutsu for example my fireball jutsu is my chakra converted into fire and shape into a ball understand not noted so how do i apply nature transformation so i replied it comes naturally to one based on the person's elemental affinity to test your affinity you first need to channel your chakra to a piece of chakra paper i don't have that at the moment so you have to get it from kakashi sensei well go ahead i'll wait Naruto returned to the house and found his sensei still asleep. Naruto woke him up temporarily to ask permission to borrow chakra paper. Without questioning, Kakashi gave two sheets to him and went back to sleep. When he returned, Sayuri explained, Perfect. Give me one. I'll demonstrate. She held one sheet between her index finger and thumb, between sending chakra to the fingers and straight to the paper. It wrinkled and then burst into small flame, reducing it to ashes. My element are fire and lightning. If yours is fire and katon or lightning, right on lightning style, it will burn or wrinkle respectively. If it is water or suit on, it will become damp. Earth or dot on earth style and it will crumble. With wind put on, the paper will tear. Now try, try it out. Release your chakra. Naruto followed her instructions. A huge gale broke out around him and he, the trees around him had their barks cracked. Branches snapped and leaves flew everywhere in a storm of chaos. Yuri was pushed back and she glared at him, causing him to stop. Uchiha grumbled, perhaps I wasn't clear enough with my instructions. Kindly channel your chakra, not release it. I apologize for my poor words of choice. Please exercise some chakra control exercises first, then do it. Sayuri snapped sarcastically. Not a sweat dropped at that. To any other shinobi, releasing and channeling chakra would mean the same. However, his chakra was so dense, so potent and voluminous that chakra control was the key difference between the two. This time chakra emitted from his fingers and entered the special piece of paper with a loud sickening rip. The two perpendicular lines formed across the paper, quartering it, and that wasn't it. The first piece burst into a huge flames, which engulfed it, reducing it into tiny black ashes. The second turned so soggy that the entire piece dissolved. The third crumbled into the fine dust, so small that it appeared that it had disintegrated, and the last wrinkled rapidly, crushing itself into a paper ball. Sayuri was a gap. Firstly, what the hell? Sheepishly, he rubbed the back of his head. I don't believe my eyes, but things happen, I guess. He spoke again, this time much calmer as she regained her bearings and Uchiha demeanor. Well, then I suppose I could teach you my far jutsus, some of them at least. Let's start with Katon, Gokyaku no jutsu. Before Sajari began, briefly, she ran through the jutsu theory and hand seals. Within 30 minutes, he could throw a decent fireball. To be honest, she was a little jealous that he could got it down quicker than she did when she first started. Sure, there was a lot of room for improvement, but to be able to even launch a decent-sized fireball was amazing in her eyes. Next, they moved on to Katon Hosenko no Jutsu, first all Phoenix Flower Jutsu. Since it was essential splitting the fireballs into smaller fireballs, Naruto got the shape transformation much faster this time and learned the Jutsu within 15 minutes. He never bragged though, choosing to instead improve his current arsenal of two Jutsus. He pushed his limits to increase their range and intensity, but only succeeded by a small margin. At 8, Kakashi woke and came by surprise training. At this point, Sakura joined them. Upon hearing of Sayori's two Tomo, Sharingan, and Naruto's five elemental wonder, Kakashi explained that he only knew of two people who had those both occurrences. Uchiha Obito, my former teammate, awakened the Sharingan with two Tomos already present. He was trying to protect me after I got my left eye slashed. Later, he died, saving me from a cave collapse and handed me his left eye countered Kakashi. Could it be because both were awakened during the need to save someone? Asked Naruto. The white-haired John shrugged. It's possible. After all, Uchiha's awakened their Sharingan when they are under incredible mental stress, usually due to the death of a loved one. This is why they call it the curse of hatred, because the more losses an Uchiha faces, the larger his hatred and thus the more power his eyes gain. In Sayuri's case, there is too little evidence for the past though it's still a possibility. I guess that's have to wait until she has children, huh? Said Uchiha blushed before suppressing her embarrassment. What about Naruto and his five elements? Sakura asked. Well, I've only heard of one man who had all five elements affinities. He's the Shirobi no Kami, 
out of shinobi and the shinobi shodai hokage hashirama senju kakashi explained whoa saru gasped in amazement naruto wasn't so surprised as he was the shodai in his past life On the other hand, he was glad that Sayuri was showing more emotion than she did on a regular basis. Honestly and hopefully, that meant she was warming up to the team. Takashi continued, My element affinity is lightning, however, my, with my shining on I had copied over a thousand jutsu from all five elements. This earned me the title of Kopi Ninja no Kakashi. However, the problem with performing jutsus that are not aligned with your affinity is that they take more chakra and chakra control to execute properly. So just a warning before you guys may get any ideas, except Naruto of course. So I'll use two shadow clones to teach Naruto and Sakura in jutsu while I myself, the original, will instruct Sayuri in the Sharingan as well as ninjutsu, right? The three getting nodded and Kakashi formed shadow clones with the original focus on teaching Sayuri's Sharingan tactics. It was impossible to teach everything he knew about the eyes as she only had two tomos. Thus, he moved on to ninjutsu and taught her his one and only original technique, the Chidori Thousand Birds. As for Naruto, he gave him two ninjutsus form each element to learn over the week. With shadow clones, they sped up the process as Kakashi revealed to Naruto. As he had recalled from the scroll of ceilings, the shadow clones just created corporal clones which once dispelled returned its chakra and memories to the user. Because of this, using shadow clones to train accelerated the process. What he could complete in an hour could be done in half an hour with a single shadow clone since he could spam hundreds as they found out later. Well, you know what happened? The only drawback was things that required muscle memory like taijutsu needed to be done manually as shadow clones could not help in that. Lastly, with Sakura, she discovered her elements, earth and water, and was taught on jutsu each of element. Kakashi figured that she had only so much chakra to spare, so it would be better if she focused more on being a support type. By dinner at 9, despite still having their work cut out for them, all three had accomplished a milestone. They discussed training over dinner, and that when Kakashi decided to drop the bombshell. I suspect Zabuza was still alive. The Jonin suddenly declared. The Ganis froze in shock, but... How? Why? Naruto asked, setting down his spoon. The standard procedure for a hunter ninja is to burn the ninkin's, Nukinin's corpse upon killing them. This is the prevent the village secrets from being leaked. However, as I recall, the Oinin just took Zabuza away, Kakashi explained. But are you 100% sure? Facing Zabuza again is a terrifying thought, Sakura asked worriedly. Kakashi reasoned. That's not the only detail. From what I remember, sandbones are not enough to kill but can induce a death-like state when thrown at the correct spot. In my fatigue, I must have overlooked that detail and thought he was really dead. Unfortunately, that means we have to most at a week to train before facing Zabuza King, and this time probably with his accomplice as well. Given his accuracy with the sand bonds, this accomplice is no pushover either, so you guys must train as much as possible. Hopefully, we'll be able to increase the odds of victory by learning the jutsus which I have just imparted to you. Alright, so we'll train extra hard this week. Naruto cried excited to get his ninjutsu up to a par with his taijutsu. Their conversation was interrupted by the cold voice of inner Tezunami's son. What's the point of all this training? When you are all going to die at the hands of Garo's men, anyway. Why are you so still cheery? What do you know about suffering? Suddenly, the room temperature dropped a few degrees, making it Okamar's shiver as killing intent flooded the house. Courtesy of Naruto. Kid, you don't understand how hard life of Shinobi is. You think you have it tough? You're wrong. Every day you must train ourselves to get even the slightest edge against your opponent so that we can live to see the other day and go back to our loved ones. We face death every single day. Even the slightest mistake can lead up to our death. So we treasure what we have and fight for our precious people. You have your mother and grandfather who love you and spoil you. People like me don't have families. I get cleared at in my own village, kicked out of stores over charge for simple things. All you need to know is, without any precious people, you cease to have a reason to exist. And if you don't stand up for yourself, no one else can do it for you, kid. Naruto replied, surprisingly, Sakura, with the amount of maturity he had in his tone, replied. In fact, she was shocked that such things have happened to Naruto. Was it true? She decided that she would ask Kakashi-sensei in private, so she would not offend Naruto if he had really gone through such things. Sayuri, on the other hand, felt an inexplicable sense of sadness for Naruto's past. She didn't question the integrity of his words and chose instead to keep silent. Kakashi was also deeply saddened by Naruto's words, knowing they were true. He was aware of his student's intent, but was disgusted by the villagers' action. They took their hatred for the fox out on a defenseless boy who knew nothing of why they did so. 
Inari was taken aback by Naruto's harsh response, having expected a retarded response about how they were going to find a way to defeat Gato and alleviate the village's suffering. Instead, Naruto's reply was more like a fuck you, deal with it, bitch, except with instructions how. The kid burst into tears and ran to his bedroom, Naruto's philosophical response still ringing in his ears. The blonde took his plate to the sink where Tazunami was and then opened the door. I'm going to train. The door was closed as Naruto stormed off, Kakashi sighed. It can't be helped then, he thought. With Naruto, he began part practicing all the jutsus he had learned and spammed shadow clones to help. By 11, he collapsed from exhaustion. Mr. Yuri, the two others had turned in for the night, but Naruto was not back yet. This had Sayuri slightly worried, as it was quite late already. Had the enemies gotten hold of him? Stealthily, she snuck out of the guest room and out of the house, venturing into the nearby forest. About 300 meters away was a huge clearing created by a large array of jutsus. It if Naruto had clashed with the enemy, the fight must have been pretty big to leave such a huge trail of destruction. To her relief, she found Naruto lying on the floor, still alive if his slightly snoring was anything to go by. He sighed and smiled stiffly as a laugh. Only he would be capable of doing all this and still sleep so peacefully like nothing happened. As gently as possible, she picked him up and leaving him here was not only dangerous but he could ask also catch a cold out in the forest all night. Slowly, she walked back to the house, carefully not waking the sleeping boy in her arms. Her face flushed when Naruto's sleeping self snuggled deeper into her embrace, pressing against her chest. A ghost of smile graced her lips. She then re-entered the house shinobi style through the window. Silently, she landed on the tatame floor of Naruto and Kakashi's room. Their sensei was fast asleep, still recapturating from his overuse of the Sharingan. His awaken earlier to check on them and having dinner left him even more wary when he finally retired to the futon as his rest was incomplete. Well, at least Sayuri could do what she was currently doing. Carefully, she lowered him down on the futon. The Uchiha located the blanket and pulled it over the sleeping blonde. Under the moonlight, his facial features were relaxed and his expression was one of peace and bliss. It generated an aura of calmness which spread to Sayuri, as she tucked her favorite blonde into the bed, she found it hard to resist and gave in to her temptations. Softly, she kissed Naruto on the cheek and whispered, Sweet dreams, naruto Now that her mind was at peace, she turned to her room and went to sleep. Unknown to her, while Naruto was most definitely asleep, his lips curled into a smile, rarely seen anymore. A smile of true happiness. The next morning, Naruto's eyes snapped open and the ground as he registered the sunlight piercing through the window. It cast a warm glow through the room, illuminating it with the brilliance of the morning. Rise and shine, kid! Kurama yelled from the mindscape, howling with laughter when the boy winced at the loud announcement rang in his heart. Clearly, he wasn't a morning person. Asura took over and declared, Today we will do something special, Naruto. Go to the local blacksmith and commission the finest sword he can make. When you get it, I will teach you Kenjutsu. It will be worth it as you get to extend your range of attacks. Right then, Naruto replied telepathically as he stood up and got downstairs for breakfast. Tazunumi san, is there a blacksmith in the town? The woman was surprised by the sudden question but nodded. He is a very famous blacksmith in the town, charges highly for his weapon but makes the best sword in Nami no Kuni. Tazunumi replied as she jolted down to the address. Here. Naruto took the piece of paper and slipped it into his pocket. Thanks, Tazunumi san. Naruto, are you going to buy a sword? Kakashi required. Yep, Sir spoke up. Can you help me get a. Uh, Chokuto, I'll give you the details on a piece of paper. Okay then, I'll be leaving after breakfast. Not replied, setting down his teacup. Once Sayuri gave him the paper, he left for the address which Tazunami gave. Sayuri and Sakura split up for their individual trainings first. Kashi would later gather them for a team exercise when Naruto returned. For now, he gra guarded Tazuna at the bridge as the bridge builder directed his workers for the massive construction taking place with Sayuri. In the spot where she found Naruto yesterday, a young girl in pink dress wearing a black choker was plucking plants and depositing them in her basket, seemingly gathering herbs. Ohio, the girl said. As she looked up from her herb picking, Ohio, Sayuri gave the customary reply. What are you doing out in the forest so early in the morning? The Uchiha spoke sporting to catch her name, Haku. The girl replied, I was picking herbs to heal a friend of mine. What about you? I'm an Uchiha Sayuri. Konoichi and I was going to begin training here. Oh, the girl choked her head in curiosity. That's interesting. What do you train for? The Uchiha replied, I train to get stronger so that I can kill my brother to avenge my clan. The girl, the girl shook her head in disappointment. That's just sad. The Uchiha growled. And how are you to say that? Are you fighting for your own sake or to protect others? Haku asked. Sayuri gazed soften. I don't know really. I guess I fight to avenge my clansmen, but at the same time, I also protect the people I love from being harmed by what I do. And the girl nodded sympathetically. 
That's something I understand. It's a different kind of love and it's must kill you inside to be hated by the one you love because to protect them you must be the villain, huh? Well, you're still fighting to protect someone precious to you and that's something I respect even greater because you sacrifice more than anybody to protect everybody. I wish you the best of luck in your endeavors and till we meet again, goodbye for now. As Siri watched Aku leave the forest clearing, she pondered on her words. She wasn't very successful in shielding Naruto from hurt and that he would eventually feel given that she had done so much for him while he was aware. If she truly wished to care for him while remaining the villain, she should do so covertly. Suddenly, she thought of Itachi. Could it be? No, if he had really wanted to protect her, he wouldn't have committed such a heinous crime as slaying the entire clan except her. He would pay dearly for his crimes and Sayuri would be the one to mete out justice for her fallen clan. Back to the topic, she was torn between covertly protecting Naruto by being the bad guy but being unable to protect him upon against threats like Sabusa as she did yesterday, or doing the same thing while allowing herself times to protect him openly by risking him finding out and loving her back. She decided that she would do the latter by passing it off as being a teammate's duty. It was safe that way. She could still be the bad guy while allowing her to protect him when needed and giving her an excuse to do so. Sai, her love life was so complicated. With that thought in mind, she commenced her training to learn and master the Chidori as well as the Sharingan. With Naruto, when he arrived at the given address, he saw a small wooden building with a large single floor. Inside there was a bright glow emanating from the forge. He knocked and entered when told to by the man inside. Welcome to my smith shop, the burly man said. So what do you need? Not replied. Two customs made sword, please. I have a particular one in mind for a friend and the other one for myself. He walked up to the stone counter and put down Sarah's notes. This is my friend's specification for her sword. As for mine, I don't care what you make as long as it's the finest you have to offer. I'll pay you handsomely for it. If don't fret. I see. The man responded, taking the piece of paper and scanning through it. Friends, one is easy to make. However, yours will take quite a while, as it will be my greatest masterpiece yet. Do you mind if it is a Yoto, Western sword? Naruto shook his head. As I said, I don't mind whatever you have planned. The blacksmith nodded and handed him a rod. Hold this for me. Take a few swings, the blacksmith requested. Naruto did so, and the man observed carefully, taking down notes. Is quite strong as the rod is relatively heavy. I figure I'll force something heavy, a dense material perhaps. Next, he took measurements of Naruto's hand, forearm, and legs to determine the weapon's perfect thickness and length. All right, I'm done. Thanks for your business. I'm Shino, Shin, Shinoho Akeba, Master Blacksmith of Nami, and it's been a pleasure working with you. You can pick up the sword in a week. Pleasure working with you too, Johnny, said Naruto before leaving the forge. A week later, Team 7 alternated between guarding Tazuna and training and today it was Suri's turn. She scowled at the bridge, suddenly became much colder. The fog had thickened and visibility was reduced slightly. For all she knew, Zabuza and the compliance was back. Kashi sensei, Sakura, we have an alert. I think the enemy is back. The Uchiha spoke into her radio. Roger that. Heading over. Where's Naruto? Kakashi asked. Sakura replied, I don't think that idiot overslept again. Probably still in the house. Good, Kakashi replied. Garo might send some men to attack house so Naruto can guard it for us. Whatever, just be here quick. I don't like the look of it. Urged Sayuri. At the moment, two blurs appeared by her side. It was Kakashi and Sakura who were training in the forest nearby in the bridge in case such a thing should happen. On the other end of the uncompleted bridge, two dark shadows stood menacingly. One had a sword left it on his shoulder. Zabza. Kakashi called in his mist. Kakashi, this time I'll finish you off for good. Takiri Nukdin replied, Take the black-haired girl. The pink-haired one is useless, so she'll probably be guarding the bridge builder. I'll handle them and Kakashi. Zabza whispered to his apprentice, the apprentice Nordis, as he wished Zabza summer. Kakashi rattled off instructions. Sorry, take that compliance. Sakura guard Tazna. I'll deal with Zabza. Hi. Both his chores and move to their respective position. The mist thickened considerably before the sound of rapid foot footfalls echoed across the bridge. Here they are come. Kakashi warned before heading off into the fog to face Zabuza. Early the footstep disappeared. Sayuri turned into time to block a strike from the fly Senbon. You're mine, the fake hunter Nin said. Voice devoid of emotion, Sayuri launched a kick into his stomach, 
However, the compliance back flipped away as he did. Sayuri took the chance to flash through hand shields. Katon, Gokyaku no Jutsu. A large fireball burst out of her mouth and flew towards the compliance, who merely shot his hands out before him. Hyotan, Hoyogo Domo. I style, I rock dome. Sayuri eyes widened when a solid dome of ice materialized around the fake hunter Nin, shielding him from the blazing sphere of flames. When it disappeared, the ice was intact without even so much of a cinch. Hyotan, is that a kick again, Kai? Suri wondered. Her attention returned to the compliance who had opened a hole in the dome and was charging towards her. The two engaged in Taijutsu and it was clear that the fake Wounin was faster. He grabbed the Uchiha's arm and formed one-handed head seals. With the other hand, Hijutsu, Sensatsu, Shiso, Secret Style. Thousand flying water needles of death, the compliance uttered. Water in the air materialized into numerous thin icicles that closed in on Sayuri. The Uchiha yanked her hand free and used her kunai to deflect all the incoming projectiles. After she was done, a powerful kick pushed against her cheese. cheeks, sending her crashing away. The fake hunter closed in on her and stomped on her, the ground where she was. Luckily, the Uchiha rolled away in time and recovered, swiping her kunai swiftly at the compliance. He brushed into shreds of vice, reappearing behind her. Beware. Hijutsu. Makyo Hoyoshio. Secret Jutsu, demonic ice mirrors, he called. Multiple mirrors made of ice surrounded her in house-like formation, prevented her escape. In each mirror, there was an image of the fake hunter Nin. Sayori growled it was infuriating that he was so fast. She didn't want to pull her trump card this early, but if her fireball earlier was anything to go by, normally fire techniques wouldn't work on it. his eyes. Sharing gun, she uttered while channeling chakra to her optic nerves. Her ink-black eyes flared with chakra, turning them into a bright vermilion hue. Around her black pupils were a ring with two spinning magatamas. Suddenly, a wave of sandbones rained down on her. Now being able to roughly trackle the sandbones, she managed to fend off most of the sandbones. Sometime still made it pass through her guard, though, and pierce her body. But she could finally see. It was not that there was no compliance in each mirror, rather the fake hunter Nin was moving so fast that he appeared to be in every mirror. However, there was a restriction to her eyes. While she could now keep track of the enemy and see the sandbones flying towards her, if her body was not fast enough, she still wouldn't be able to block them. Experiencing her own painful deaths helplessly in slow motion was definitely not on her to-do list for today nor any day for that matter. So instead, she tried to shift positions to throw off his accuracy. Still, there were literally everywhere and it was quite hard to evade them all. Given that she was trapped in the sadistic house of mirrors, blocking him for with her kunai was her only choice. In the times where one slipped past her guard, it pierced through her delicate skin, easily and stung like hell. Words they felt were very cold and numbed the struck area slightly. Her eyes widened when she saw Zabza's compliance shooting out from the mirror. Usually he traveled along the mirrors, but this time he flew through the air right at her with Naruto earlier. The Uzumaki woke up and realized that Kakashi was gone from the room. When he checked, so was Hiruri and Sakura. Damn it, he overslept again. He went downstairs to find them, but paused mid steps when he heard a commotion downstairs. Don't kill my mom, Naruto heard Inari cry. <laughs> Kaki, we were given orders and we'll follow them. Perhaps we'll kill you first. Have some fun with your mom, then kill her too. A man spoke. Clearly, there were more than one due to the Wii, but how many exactly? Naruto extended his sensory range and found four weak chakra signatures one woman, a child, and two men. Yes, he could even tell apart the genders and age based on their chakra signatures. They were weak as they were not shinobis, but civilians still had a trace of chakra. Obviously, the woman was Tazunami and the child was Inari, meaning there were two enemies in the house. Based on the weak chakra presence, they were probably bandits. Naruto could detect the fears and oppression in the environment. Kurama's negative emotion sensing. Well, it was time to step in. Faster than they could see, two shadows clone appeared behind the two bandits and drove kunas into the bases of their skull. When they collapsed, Tuzunmi shrieked in horror at the sight. Naruto sighed as he walked down the stairs. Sorry for the blood, but I have zero tolerance for rapists. If they were here, if it's probably means Zabuza is back to attack Tazuna's son. I have to go. In a burst of speed, he disappeared. When he neared the bridge, he noticed Zabuza's oppressed chakra laced through the air. Sakura and Tazuna felt fear. Suri alarm. He saw a formation of mirror when Suri was in, and another chakra signature, a female about the same age as them, but slightly older. Her chakra was very special, a Kagekenka perhaps. Right now, at his current speed, he was her. He saw her jumping out of one mirror to another, lunging towards 
Sayuri with Sanbon. He ran into the mirrors and tackled the Uchiha to the floor before the person could even react. The enemy girl flew into the opposite mirror and remained there. Now that he had halted, he could not keep track of the girl's movement and it appeared as if she was in every single mirror. Sayuri blinked in surprise before pushing him off. Why are you here? Once you come in, you can't get out. Sayuri whispered fiercely. Naruto defended. She was flying at you with a sunburn and you appeared frozen then. I had to help. Wait, she? Sayuri asked in confusion. Yes, she is slightly older than us and building a Ken Kekagenkai, I think. How do you know? Sayuri asked, bewildered that he had such information considering that he had just entered the battle. Now is not the time to explain. Focus on fighting her. She's fast. The blonde nodded. No, she's too fast for me to avoid, but I can track her movements. Sayuri replied as she eyed the compliance. The opposite is true for for me. I have the speed to avoid her, but I can't see her in time. Alright then, I'll be your eyes and you'll be my body. Sayuri decided. Naruto not even raised a kunai. If he can't in, raised her eyebrow behind the monster. Then she bounced. Two o'clock. Sayuri warned. Naruto swiped his hands outburst in the indicating direction and felt his kunai come in contact with the enemy sandbone. With all his natural strength, he pushed back and sent the opponent flying back into the mirror. She then threw another sandbone at him. 5 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 11 o'clock, Sayuri replied with visual rapidity. Naruto was having a hard time keeping up because he first had to register what she was saying, then associate it with the direction and then act at, out accordingly. It didn't help that she began spamming directions as, well as soon as Zabuza's complaints began rapidly launching sandbones from rapid directions. The moment their coordination flattered was the moment the enemy struck. Like snow, the thin needle rained down on Naruto and he did not detect them in time. Quickly, Sayuri performed a substitution and took his place. She braced herself as a, like a relentless blitz of snow, the thin needles pelted her, turning her into a pinch cushion for her thousands of scent bones, which pierced into her body. Sayuri! Naruto cried as his teammate collapsed on the floor. He kneeled down and poured up her back on his knee. What did you do that? You couldn't let me handle it. Uchiha gave a dry laugh, even her inner current state as blood dripped from her mouth. There was no time to think. My body moved on its own or sat on Kachi. And I promised myself that I would stay alive to kill Itachi. Is this really end? She thought to herself. Well, at least that could be useful. Fight on Naruto for me. Don't let your dream die. With those words, her eyelid closed, shut, and her body went limp. Naruto felt her pulse fade away. The blonde eyes widened. He dreamed to become Hokage, where he was there time to think of that now, when his own teammate was dying before his eyes and no less for him so that he could live on. What kind of sick twisted world did this kind of shit to him? Did he deserve it? Was there something he could do to change it? There had to be something. The fake hunter didn't spoke. She found a strength she never knew she had. Why? Because of a certain person who was precious to her. To save that person, she took his place knowingly it was a trap. She was a true ninja, worthy of honor. Is this the first time you have seen a friend die in the battle? This is part of a ninja. Shut up! Save me the Iology. I'll kill you right where you stand. Now the road in a savage fury, his chakra was released, exposing his powerful chakra presence to the world. A large surge of wind radiating outwards from him and the stone floor beneath him cracked, almost shattering under the indirect pressure of chakra. But what is this chakra presence? It's so strong. Nothing I felt before Sabsa compliance thought this chakra. The last time I felt it was from Sandam Sama himself, and even then his was incomparable to this. This is bad, thought Kakashi Verdi. But what is that massive amount of chakra and killing in death? It's far from mine in ferocity. Zabuza thought the rage and the bloodlust was dangly in the air, making it hard to breathe. Sakura and Tausana were choking and trembling badly as a seemingly new entity altogether entered the battle. His chakra is getting increasingly potent. It's best to strike soon as possible. The fake Onin thought as ready some sand bones. She flickered her wrist, raising the projectiles at Naruto. The blonde swiped his hand at the incoming projectiles and they shattered after coming into contact with his chakra. What? The compliance thought. A yellow hurry shrouded Naruto and four black orbs with purple glow floated behind his back. He gave a loud blood curling roar which pierced through the ears of all who heard it. He shook the entire bridge as the ice mirror shattered in a great explosion of chakra. The fierce winds died down as Naruto looked up. His eyes were full of hatred for the one who ended Sayori's life. The compliance shivered and realized something. You are way stronger than me. I'm sorry I failed up the summer. I'm nothing but a broken and useless tool now. End my life. 
Not a slightly stunned by her thinking. What kind of logic is that? You're not a tool. You're a shinobi in your own right. The vacant and retaliated. And that's what a shinobi is. A person who is a tool for the person who buys his services. Since I failed, I have no right to live. Now end my life. Naruto was appealed. That's not what a shinobi is. You're a person too. You have emotions and a personality. You do not deserve to die simply because you could defeat an adversary stronger than you. That's stupid. Haku scoffed and tried to rile him up. Is that how weak your will is? When you swore vengeance against me for your friend's death, were they just empty words? Naruto growled and cocked his wrist back with a punch. He sent her crashing into the ground 10 meters away. Shut she got up, her mask shattered to reveal her face. Come on. You can do better than that. Kill me. I deserve death for failing my master. He then heard the crackling of electricity a short distance away. Eyes widening, Haku said, suddenly said, Wait, I still have final use for my master. As an ice f mirror formed beneath her feet and she dropped into it disappearing with Kakashi earlier. I should have ended this quickly. I don't like the feel of that chakra. The Konoha joined in thought, drawing a scroll from his vest and opening it. He cut his thumb and opened with a kunai and... Located on his flake jacket, he wiped the blood on his line across the middle of the scroll and sealed it shut. Placing it between his thumb and index finger, he formed the hand seals, tiger, snake, dragon, dog, slamming the scroll onto the ground. He uttered Kyochisino Jutsu, summoning earth style. Fang pursued Jutsu, activating the Doton Jutsu. Lines of black kanji scrabbled out of the scroll, ending and shot into the ground, the scroll vibrating vigorously as it did, so until there were no more lines existing, it 10 meters away where Zabza was, the line bursted out of the ground and in a flurry of smoke revealed Kakashi's ninkens. As entire pack of hounds restrained the Kiri ninkin, allowing him to prepare his ultimate technique against Zabza. Forming the ox, rabbit and monkey hand seal, Kakashi then brought his hand palm up with his left hand, clutching the wrist. A circle of Rython Chakra appeared around his feet, with electricity charging shooting up to his right hand like the surface of a plasma ball. When touched, it charged his ultimate and original Jutsu which was even stronger than the Prognator, the Chidori. The s rank Rython Jutsu crackling loudly in his hand, the sound of the gathering of copious amounts of Chakra. He slid his hand down and charged towards Abza, his sharing gun vision already tunneling and locking onto his targets. Raikiri! Lightning Blade! Kashi yelled as he sprinted across towards the restrained Ninkin. Suddenly, an ice mirror formed above the space before Zabza. From it, Haku dropped down and intercepted the assassination jutsu with her own body. Kakashi tried to stop it, but it was too late as riding on pilot learner. Linear movement of the record disallowed him uh, from wavering, of course, from his target. It shrieked uh, like the call of a bird and pierced through Haku's chest, plunging deep into his her lung cavity and destroying her heart with the influx of Rhyton Chakra. Zabza smirked in satisfaction. Looks like I found a useful tool. Naruto heard him and yelled, Was that all you thought of her? A tool? Hmm. He replied and broke free from his Ninken bounds. Heftingly, Kubiri Bocho off his back, he pulled his sword arm back. Alarmed, Kakashi thought. He intended to me take he intends to take me out together with the child. He drew Haku in close to his body and backflipped away. Just as Zabza swung his sword at him. When Kakashi landed, he put Haku on the floor and pulled his bloody hand off out of her corpse. He placed two fingers on her pupils and slid it shut. Game Fuku no Game Fuku wo you know Gomai Fuku no Norimasu. Sorry about the Japanese, but it is written here. I can't say what it was, so anyway. On to our story. Kakashi whispered, wishing her peace in the afterlife. Oh, I guess that's what it meant. If only he knew how the afterlife was. He stood up and glared at Zabza. You disgust me. He threw two kunais which blurred themselves deep into Zabza's left shoulder. A younger Zabza charged at Kagashi, his left arm now limp from injury. The Konoha Jonin threw a right hook at his face and performed a spinning heel kick which sent him back. Growling the Nuklin swung his sword horizontally which Kakashi jumped up to avoid it. Then he swung it down at vertical chop. It planted itself deep into the ground where Kakashi was earlier. The Konoha Jonin appeared behind him in his tension and brought his hand towards his swordsman's neck. You shall die now. Kakashi said without emotion, that's what you told me in the previous chapter. Zabuza muttered under his breath, pardon? Nothing. Kakashi was about to strangle him when from the 
uncompleted end of the bridge, a man in a business suit clapped his hand. Surrounding him were dozens of mercenaries. Well, well, well. Looks like you couldn't even take care of a couple of Kohn Hanins, you old geezer. Zabza, but that's fine, because I never intended to pay you anyway, came the snobbish voice of Gato. My plan was to let the Kohn Hanin finish you off, and while they were still weakened by you, have my henchmen kill the men and rape the wound. <laughs> well, at least the bitch is dead. Strolling over Hako's corpse, he gave it a kick and stomped on her arm. You, I'll kill you, Zabza raised, sh literally shouted. A shroud of chakra animated from him in the form of a purple demon, Sharingan no Kakashi. Let's call it a truce. I want to kill Gato and his men, Zabza declared. Give me a kuna. Kashinori tossed over one to the Nuknin, who clutched it between his teeth. Ditching the Kuburi Bocho, he charged at Gato and his men with a savage cry. There were no words to describe the ensuing carnage. It was simply this, a massacre. The demon of the mist cut down every single henchman standing there, though some had time to slash or stab him while their weapons were still intact with their hands. While he was dealing with their colleagues, others were simply too intimidated to do anything as they were bisected by Zabuza's kunai. Eventually, Zabuza reached the magnet who was shivering in fear. The corn gato was literally between the devil and the deep blue sea. For Zabuza had him trapped right at the edge of the bit. Don't kill me, I'll pay you. Gato played the nuketin, shook his head. I grow tired of your lies, Gato. This is for Hako. With a single swipe, he disemplored the tyrant while sending him down into a watery grave. Zabuza too was already extremely exhausted. His various injuries began to take their toll on him as he strode weakly to Hako's corpse before collapsing next to her. Makashi, here grabs out, gaining the attention of nearly anyone there. I have a final wish. Bury me next to Haku. The fire-haired Jonin nodded solemnly, watching as the swordman pressed away. The two would be buried with honor. The gathered villages cheered loudly, for Gato's monopoly had finally been broken. Naruto did not share the same sentiments, as once the adrenaline wore off, he remembered that his teammate had died for him. His need became weak when he came near the body of Seori. Her corpse was riddled with numerous sand bones. Tears of sorrow filled his eyes before they dropped onto the peaceful face of her teammate. Voice stricken with grief, he whispered, You did not have to die, so why? Kami, please tell me. At the very least, she deserved a funeral and a grand as well, just like Zabuz and his compliance. As this is where I'm going to be leaving this part of guys, I hope you like this one and if you do, please leave a like and subscribe to my channel and this is Apollo. Ch